Hi everyone. Um, we're going to get started. There's probably going to be people trickling in and joining in the first 10-15 minutes, but we're going to just go ahead and stay on time. Um, welcome everyone. We're excited to have you join us tonight. I'm Sarah Walco. I'm the Director of Education and Community Engagement at the Visual Arts Center of New Jersey. And we're really excited to welcome Adrian Wheeler here with us tonight. Um, so I'm just gonna talk for a second about the logistics of the evening. Um, we would really appreciate if you would keep yourself on mute. We are going to, I'm gonna introduce our curator, Mary Birmingham. She's gonna be in conversation with a visual presentation with Adrian Wheeler. And then we definitely will take questions at the end, but we'd appreciate if you'd um, just wait till the end and tell your questions, but also if you want to just go ahead and type them into the chat box while the presentation is going on to make sure you don't forget them or anything. The chat box um, is down at the bottom of the screen. You can go ahead and keep it open during this entire talk and I'll be monitoring that and I'll be also then reading out the questions to Adrian at the end to answer them. So and at any point you can access that. So as I said, they're going to be talking for probably about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to um, the question and answer period. So I'm going to pass it over to Mary, but I just wanted to quickly say that um, Adrian's um, site-specific installation is on view at the Visual Arts Center from now until January 18th. Um, it's really beautiful. Come see it. And Adrienne is a multimedia artist. She's an independent curator. She's an arts educator and she's an advocate for social justice. And you're really going to hear a lot about her work in depth tonight. And we're excited to be working with her. Okay, Mary, want to take it from there? Sure thing. Uh, thanks again. And thank you, Adrian, for sharing uh, your work with us and also your stories, because um, this is White Dress Narratives is really a series of stories. And I know that they're personally connected to you. So I think we should just get started and let you tell your story. Um, we're starting off with, of course, a picture of the installation. But I'm really thrilled that you're willing to tell us the story behind the installation and how you came to make this work. So we're all ears. Okay. Well, thank you. And I want to thank um, all of you, Melanie Cohen, you, Mary, Sarah, and Kim, and Noel, because Noel did a lot. I mean, everybody did a lot, but at some point, Noel was actually sitting with me at the top of the stairs, sewing, hand stitching. No, yes, no. and, I, and I'm, I'm right. remiss. Oh. I, what I should have said was that um, I should have also pointed out Noelle Park uh, was the guest curator for this show. So she did really all of the work of bringing Adrian. Went above and beyond the call of duty with this. Yeah. <laughs> I, Thank I you. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all of you. And I love, this is one of my favorite centers, museums. I, I love this space and I, I'm really honored to be um, exhibiting here. Thank you. So what we're looking at here, this installation is a collection of nine dresses, uh, nine different individuals representing six generations of women in my family, mother to daughter, mother to daughter, mother to daughter. So the first one would be Adeline Hilliard, who's my great, great grandmother. And this is on my maternal, well, obviously on my maternal line. The second one is Willie Kate Hilliard Norwood. The third one, my grandmother, is Ruby Norwood Moore. And then the first one in the second row is my mother, Elizabeth Moore Wheeler. And then the next one represents me, Adrienne Elaine Wheeler. My sister, Lydia Blanche Wheeler Hall. Uh, her oldest daughter, Leah Carol Avis Hall my daughter, Nadira Elizabeth Wheeler, and my sister's youngest daughter, uh, Miriam Sahar Hall, Mari. I think you've met Mari at the, um, at the opening. So um, 
the, the dress is actually a, almost like a paper, a paper cutout of the image of the dress that my mother made for her eighth grade graduation from Morton Street Elementary School in 1942 in Newark, New Jersey. And it's her story and my grandmother's story uh, is a, a story of migration. They migrated from Georgia, from Bainbridge, Georgia. Well, my mother's birthplace is Bainbridge, Georgia, but they migrated from Lumpkin, Georgia, was actually their place of departure to Newark during the second wave of the Great Migration. So the use of the dress came about um, when I was an artist in residence with Nick Klein at Rutgers University for the Glass Book Project. And we were, um, I'm, oh, this is my mother. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's my mother in the dress on her graduation day. And that's the actual dress. Um, and of course, every image that we see of the dress from this point on takes the shape of the dress on the right. Once I pho photographed it, you know, that was it. So it's every, every iteration of this dress looks like this. Um, and it was in my grandmother's cedar chest for over 70 years when uh, Nick and I, each year the Glass Book Project has a theme. And the first year that I was the artist in residence, um, our, our provisions was the name of that iteration. It was the 10th iteration. But we were using um, the Kruger Scott African American Oral History Project. And my mother, although she was not one of the original interviewees, her story certainly fit the, um, well, she fit the demographic. So I decided instead of choosing and transcribing one of the other interviews in the collection, that I would use the same document, the same series of questions, interview my mother, and then create this abstract portrait of the person whose interview I had chosen. So that was the first, the first appearance of the dress was for the Glass Book Project. And I say that the dress is it's almost like a magic carpet because, or a genie, once it was released from that cedar chest, it has just taken me and it has gone, you know, a, across uh, oceans and continents. And I took it with me most recently um, in March, I took it with me to Senegal and I photographed um, a few young girls either holding the dress or wearing the dress. So well, you'll have to share those with us when yeah, you, yeah. in the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, I, I see the dress. Um, I mean, obviously it's very personal. I mean, it's personal to my mother. It's, it represents her mother's story as well. I mean, hers was the decision to, to leave Georgia, to come north for better opportunities for my mother and for herself as well, for better work opportunities, um, educational opportunities. For my mother. So I think it, it represents not just their story, but I think it represents the story of many women, you know, who have chosen that path, women who have excelled academically or in work-wise or any, any number of ways. I think the dress stands as a symbol for, for many women. Do you want the next? Um, um, you, you just probably should have to tell okay, her. So yeah. Okay, so that is the glass. That's the glass book that I ultimately ended up making. It wasn't my original idea. My original idea was to have the image of the dress sandblasted on glass. So we worked with glass roots in Newark. While I was waiting for the sample to come back, I had all these little paper cutouts. And we, each of us, students included, were given a box and about six or seven sheets of glass. So I was sitting at night and I would just cut out these paper, like almost like paper dolls, but cut out the paper dresses. And then I just started to layer them in between the sheets of glass 
and decided that I really did love the layering and it just seemed to, um, to just take, take off and spring out of the book in some way. And then I used um, duct tape and gold thread to bind it so it would actually appear to be a book where it's actually a sculpture because you can't open it at all. Uh, the and is that also oh. nine dresses? That is also nine dresses. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's not nine dresses. Let's see, one, two. Oh, you know what? I actually have the prototype right here. So I can tell you how many dresses. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight dresses here. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, there are eight dresses here because this piece is actually called Elizabeth. This is not called white dress narratives. The idea of white dress narratives came a little later when I actually created the body of work that you're exhibiting because it was originally created to exhibit at the um, Ventana Festival at Frankston Art Center in Frankston, Australia. So when you did the book, um, the, the Glass Book Project, this is really using the dress to kind of personify your mother and her story alone. Right. Yeah. And then you kind of expanded it to us and beyond um, where you made it about more than just your mother, correct? Yeah, um, yeah, yes. Because it sort of took on a life of its own and I guess spoke to me. Yeah. Yeah. So what are we gonna look at next? Okay, so this is the first dress in the series. This is Adeline Hilliard, who would be my great, great grandmother. And this is her headstone. I use the headstone because there's an absence of photographs, um, which is ironic because I did a lot of work as a photographer and my dad was a photographer as well. So it's frustrating for me you know, not to have that kind of imagery. So I look for, you know, I use documents, I use anything I can to substitute for um, a photograph and, you know, anything that would help me create or have some sense of who the person was. Mm -hmm. So this one just has the basic information, the year that she died, which was 1896. And I think she was 46 years old. So that puts her birth around 1850. So, so each of these dresses the, has the stitching, which you can see here, and we'll see close-up uh, images of the stitches later. But I use the stitches almost as a way to draw, to draw out um, my ideas about their narrative or create a narrative for each person. Particularly, I say create because for the individuals that I really didn't know, I'm either creating a story based on historical facts, based on things like documents, census documents, uh, tombstones, stories that I may have heard. So hers just has this series of continuous lines, just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth because she lived at a time where her life was agricultural and basically she was farming. I've seen documents um, where whoever the informant was listed her occupation as a um, farm hand or farmer or and they were farming their own land. She was born in Florida but when she was actually farming and having children she was in um, a place called Blowing Cave, Georgia. And where is the grave? The grave is in Ezel Cemetery in Wakulla County, Florida. Florida. Yeah, so she started in Florida, went to Georgia, and then back to Florida. And is it correct, M. Adrian, this is the farthest back that you can trace your um, I, matriarchal? Well, since, since I made these dresses, I've continued to do research. So there actually would be, I think, a dress before hers, and that person's name uh, is Nancy Harrell, or Harrell. Wow. Yeah. How did you and, find that out? Well, this is, a, you know, more of this creating in a census document. 
Yeah. And there's this other woman living in the house whose name is Nancy Harrell. And the way she's described is as a mother-in-law. So I assume that she was my Kit um, Hilliard, my great, great grandfather. I assume that that was his mother-in-law, which would have made her Adeline's mother. Because I know she wasn't, I know that that woman was not Kit's mother. Wow. Yeah, so this is a little creative license on my yeah, part. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> there may be another dress. I collect old photographs, so my mother always says that I'm collecting ancestors and building, you know, my own family. So I take that license when I'm doing this research. <laughs> Uh, and, and one thing I really like about this juxtaposition, and I hadn't seen the, the picture of the, the gravestone, but I just love how whoever took this picture, they captured that, you know, kind of mottled surface and yeah. you kind of see the lines and you see the, the white and the beige of the stone. And it really is echoed in the dress so yeah, well. Yeah, almost I mean, identical in, in yeah. some ways, yeah. And where the writing and then the stitching. Yeah. And I'm assuming this came from a project that was done with elementary school students where they were just researching who was buried with the historical society. So I'm assuming that either a student or someone from the historical society actually took the photograph. Wow. But I'm grateful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it was a real find for me. Uh, let's see, what's the next image? So this is my grandmother, my grandmother Ruby on the left. And again, my mother in the dress. And she settled in Newark. She Ruby. settled in Newark. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the, Kr the Kruger Scott African American Oral History Project was very specific that the all of the interviewees, they were peer interviews, but each one had migrated from the South, but specifically to Newark, you know, not to any of the other cities, you know, that were part of the great migration. And, and so you, did you ever know your great grandmother or not? No, I didn't know my great grandmother because she died in childbirth or shortly after childbirth with my grandmother's youngest sibling. Oh, okay. That was Willie oh, Kate. That was, Willie Kate was my great grandmother. Yeah. And then Ruby was your My grandmother. grandmother. Right. And Ruby, Ruby was the game changer. <laughs> she yeah, was the one, yeah. You know, that made, she was a game changer twice. Um, when she was a, a young woman, she overheard her father saying that she was getting to be of age where she would be able to work as a farmhand and help out with the family. And she didn't want that. So she found herself a husband. My grandfather was uh, an AME minister, an African Methodist Episcopal minister. And this is uh, Greater St. Mark, African, Amer African, mm, AME, African Methodist Episcopal <laughs> Church in, right, in Lumpkin, Georgia. I only recently found this photograph because my mother was uh, thinking about taking a trip to Georgia, but she wanted to go back to Lumpkin, which is not her birthplace, but it's the place that they, it's where they let, were living when they left Georgia. And she talks about it extensively in her, um, in her interview. And I chose this photograph because it gives you a sense of the grading of the land. And her house was directly across the street. And she talked about how the house was built on stilts because you see this is up the hill. So the, the um, house was built on the decline of a hill. So it was built on, or it was raised, not that it was built on stick, stilts. I think it was raised more with cinder blocks, but she talked about how the kids in the neighborhood, she and her friends would be able to play underneath the house. And then there was the land behind, the yard behind that sort of continued down the hill. So we the flooding to because there was a lot of flooding. Well, she didn't talk about any flooding. She just talked more about the memory of playing under the house with the kids and what the front porch of the house looked like and how kind people were to, um, as she said, preachers' children. That you know they would leave fruits and all sorts of gifts for her. She, you know, she grew up as an only child. 
So, and we, and how old was how old was your mother when they could they came north? Um, eight. So she she yeah. does. Because they left, yeah, they left, I think, in 37, in 1937. So she was like, no, I think nine. Yeah, wow. nine when they left. They took the train here. Yeah. So, um, and that's, this is how I was able to identify it, because she talked about it, the, what the church looked like, the cemetery that was on the church property. And my grandfather was actually the pastor of this church when they left, you know, when they left Georgia. So let's see what's next. Okay, so we're back to the installation here at, um, at Visual Arts Center. One thing, um, maybe just talk a little bit, um, I don't know if people can see from the slide, but um, you've basically treated the um, surface of each dress, which is cut from canvas um, differently. So you've used different um, techniques of stitching and also painting. So can you just talk a little bit about um, how you came to those decisions and what you did? Well, yes, this, is, this was not my original idea. My original idea was to paint each, each dress solid white. And I worked on this, the whole body of work um, up in the Adirondacks on the lake. So I had everything laid out on the deck and I had, you know, rollers and brushes. And that's the way it painted. You know, some of the dresses, all of the paint, more paint soaked in than others. And when I looked at it, it seemed to work generationally. You know, the earliest generation had the most saturation and then it just, gets less and less and less as you go through the generation. So I thought that, you know, that that might have been symbolic in some way that, you know, these narratives, well, obviously that the narratives changed, um, but there was not less information, but different information for each one. So I decided to leave them like that. And I already knew that I wanted to paint and stitch. That I knew because I had tested before I started working on them. I tested two different versions, either to paint and stitch on top of the paint or to stitch first and then paint on top of the stitch. And then it, the decision was to paint first and then stitch just because visually it was more interesting. You know, you didn't lose the detail in the stitching by doing it that way. And, and did you try to, um, in the stitching, in the patterns of the stitching, did you try to, were you trying to say something about the individuals at all? Or I, Yeah, absolutely. Each one is that individual story as I've either created it or as I know it or as it's continuing to evolve. So each pattern is very different. Some of it is very deliberate. There are other dresses or portions of dresses where the stitching is random where I just put the, the dress under the needle and just let it go, let it move as it would based on really in some ways where the paint was thickest and it would often move away from that to the thinner part of the canvas because obviously that would have been the easier part to stitch. So. It almost becomes it beca almost becomes like a, a a gesture of sorts, like a yeah. gestural mark, yeah. when when you put it that way, which which is interesting. Yeah, a little more expressionistic, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I I just want to point out to everyone is that the the serendipity that is sometimes involved in um, doing a site specific installation. So Adrian had these dresses that she had created and um, she had shown them elsewhere. And so every time when you're doing installation art, obviously, and she'll tell you more about this later, but each time you work with the materials in a different place, it looks differently. And so um, one of the things that we decided together was um, to paint the wall a color that would make the dresses stand out. And somehow, I, I don't remember, oh, I, I think maybe Adrian, did you say you had always envisioned them being against gold or something? Well, I used gold in the glass book project because it's the, 
the sculpture is bound in gold and each dress is tied with gold thread, with the same gold thread that it's bound with. But when I started the mural project, I wanted those two walls. I wanted the background gold, but it would have been too expensive you know, for the project for them to use a gold paint that would have rendered the same kind of gold that we have you know, on the wall here. So I was super excited when you said, well, what are you thinking about color? And I was thinking, I was sort of hesitating. And then you said, what about gold? And I was thrilled. Well, that's what I mean about serendipity. It was, it was yeah. interesting because I kind of saw them on gold too, even though not knowing that story. And when you told me that, and, and I should also um, make an official um, thanks to um, gold acrylics, gold, gold, golden acrylics, sorry gold acrylics um, and uh, because I reached out to them for advice about what kind of paint would give a nice metallic glow and they um, they actually donated the paint to us so um, yeah and it's perfect because you have the skylight so it changes you know according to the time of day the weather conditions outside it really is beautiful yeah. I love it it's, it's gorgeous. And um, what I, my favorite thing about it is that at a certain time of day, the way the sunlight strikes it, the top row gets this real kind of heavenly glow to it. Yeah. And it really, to me, speaks to the idea that those are your ancestors. And, you know, the, the people, the six dresses on the bottom part of the installation are all represent living people, but mm. the three at the top are deceased and they're, you know, really your ancestors. So there's something almost like altar-like about this, like mm -hmm. as if, if it's the altarpiece of a church or something. And I just love it when the sunlight hits them and kind of lights them up. It's really beautiful, but yeah. anyway. Yeah. So let's see, where are we going now? Oh, so these are, this is a two detail shots of the stitching. And this again, I think is from that first dress. As you can see, just the continued rows of planting, you know, it's just- Like furrows, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's planting and then also uh, children, you know, ch just this childbearing. And she's a woman who, was pregnant many times and lost a lot of children as was very common then you know, the infant mortality rate was pretty high then so there were lots of children born and lots of you know rows that planting rows that had to be planted and cotton cotton was one of the crops that they were planting and you're you're actually using a kind of cotton fabric, right? Yeah, it's a cotton, yeah, it's cotton canvas. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. The thread is not cotton. The thread is a, a, a polyester. It's actually um, an embroidery thread because it has a slight sheen. So I got over the cotton because it did have a slight sheen. So it reflects light, you know, at different, at different points. This is the installation from the Frankston Art Center. That, that exhibition was in 2018 and the exhibition itself was called Pure Power and my installation was White Dress Narrative. So that was the, <clears throat> excuse me, the real birth of White Dress Narratives. Um, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> no, I was just going to just to say something briefly about this, that there were 15 other women that worked with me on this project in the Pure Power exhibition. Is there an, there's another set of dresses, absolutely gorgeous dresses, where each woman used this exact same template, used it for their own narrative. Um, three or four of the women, everyone had migrated at some point to Australia. And then there were a few women who were indigenous, who are indigenous Australians. So the treatment of each dress was very, very different. And none of them were white. None of the dresses were white. They were all very colorful. Um, 
one woman's dress was particularly powerful. Um, she actually was part of the stolen generation. So she used uh, documents, all kinds of documents, government documents that were trying to support the separation of children from families. Um, and she, she made a little apron. And in her case, the apron was representative of domestic work that the children were being uh, trained to do. She had, there were other, other documents, letters from family members trying to get their children back. And eventually the children were reunited with their families, but it was just, you know, very, very strong, um, powerful story. This, this took place in Australia? In Australia. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the place where this exhibition was? This is the uh, Frankston Art Center. It's the largest regional art center. This Frankston is a suburb just outside of Melbourne. Melbourne. In Melbourne. And did you <laughs> go there? I did go there. Mm -hmm. so, so did you actually like work with women who I worked were with creating I their worked own? with women and I worked with children. There was an elementary school across the street and the children used again the same template but with paper and they all they all made their own dresses of uh, boys and girls many of whom were immigrants as well you know from some from africa some from europe some from southeast asia wow and and, and they so all talk they, about their stories those, were those exhibited along with yours or there was one dress chosen to exhibit exhibition and then the rest of the dresses were made into a mural inside the school it was wow. really, yeah it was a wonderful experience that sounds great yeah yeah so that's why i say this dress is magical you know that it's it it has its wings <laughs> it has wings <laughs> yeah let's see what are we oh so i think the next one this is my mother and me. This is the dress uh, two years ago, also in 2018 at the Newark Arts Festival, one of the exhibitions. The, the exhibition was curated by Armisi Smith. It was called Nice Nasty. So <laughs> this, <laughs> this I, hung, I decided to hang these because they are always on the wall and sort of very seriously laid out. And I wanted something more playful. So I hung them on a clothesline. Plus I have these wonderful memories of clothes drying on a line from my own childhood. So I always like that visual of, you know, things hanging with, with clothes pins. So it's actually the dresses, it's a real clothesline and they're attached with um, clothes pins. I have some of those same memories. It's interesting. Yeah. Generational yeah. Thing. yeah. And this, this is my mother. This is the year she turned 90. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a few months after she retired. Wow. Yeah. Yep. And then is the next one the, the mural? So this is the, and this is my mother's absolute favorite. I mean, she just, she marvels at the dress because there are 42 dresses on two walls and it occupies 418 feet, linear feet. So it's, it's at the south end of McCarter Highway. So if you're coming from the airport into downtown Newark, it's you know, on your right. But I think what is particularly poignant about this is that these dresses now rest right under the tracks that my mother and my grandmother would have arrived in Newark. Um, they just, they would have just, the train would have gone right over these dresses. As those trains did every night, we worked for a little over a week from 8 p.m. until 5 a.m. We had debriefings every night from Amtrak. We were working with hard hats and reflector vests. Each night they had to bring out all of our equipment. We had a debriefing with the Amtrak guys in their warehouse where the paints were being um, stored overnight. They closed down one lane. I had really the easiest two walls 
to, well, easy in, in one sense, the two walls. One, because I wasn't right on the street. Yeah. You know, there's one part where the wall is smooth, but you are right on, there's, there's no space to walk. You're just right there on the park. The artists, this, yeah. this was wonderful. The weather was great. Um, I had the only all woman team. Uh, Bumi, Ade Bumi, Badebo assisted me, and so did um, Karen King Choi from Rutgers. Oh, wow. Yeah, she was, she also assisted me. So Just the three of you did it? Just the three of us. Well, Le Lenny helped as well because we had to have, this was really very production oriented. We had a computer, a generator, and a high lumen projector. So we had to project that image one dress at a time, project it, trace it, move, <laughs> move everything, the generator, the computer, wow. the projector, recalibrate it. And, and then the way the wall is graded, it changes, you know, with each sure. movement, each, as you move each dress. And the difficult part was the painting because it's not a flat surface. So there were times where Boomi and I were there with two paintbrushes, one in each hand, just sort of <laughs> trying to fill in all of those little gaps. But it, it worked for me in one way because my original idea or what my ideal idea would have been was to do a sculptural mural, but you couldn't drill into the wall. Amtrak wouldn't allow that. So the fact that I have the original wall and you have all these variations in the surface and textures, it does actually read sculpturally, you know, when you're walking past or when you're riding past it and the dresses appear to move because you have bulges in the shoulders or sometimes bulges in the breast or in the bottom part of the dress. So it, it, it worked out well, but my mother, loves this. I and bet. She, <laughs> she really does. Every, her. Yeah, every time she rides past it, she's like, oh, and no matter who she's with, she says, that's my dress. <laughs> so that's my dress. Yeah. How, yeah. how many feet long is it? 418. It's wow. two walls, but a total of 418 feet. And the crazy thing is we had no way of knowing how many dresses we were going to end up with. No kidding. There are, there are 42 dresses, and that graduation year was 1942. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's such a perfect circle, the whole yeah. story, you know, I mean, yeah. it, it, and, and, and the story goes on. As you've said, like your nieces and your daughter, there's more to their stories that yeah. are not on the dresses yet. You know? And my youngest niece is the only one who saw her dress before it was finished and actually had some input. I didn't allow anyone else to have input. But if you look closely at her dress, there's nothing at the top. And she asked that I not put anything at the top because her story wasn't complete yet. I guess she saw that somehow as, you know, symbolic of incompletion, so. So a wise woman. Can you, um, uh, I forgot to ask you before, can you, Talk a little bit about the role of sewing in your family, because it seems like there's no pun intended. Yeah, well, that yeah the, the, the stitching the is it, it's symbolic as well. Um, yeah. In that interview, again, my mother goes into great detail talking about the dress that, or the suit actually, that my grandmother sewed for her for the train trip up, you know, the train trip up from Georgia. And it was a brown suit suit with a big, I guess, like Peter Pan collar. I think that's how she referred to it as a Peter Pan collar. And, you know, my grandmother sewed not everything, but she sewed a lot of her clothes. And there were things that she had that I always assumed were store-bought. When she died, we were clearing out her cedar closet. And I found a bag of scrap fabrics. And those scrap fabrics matched coats and suits and dresses that I thought were store-bought clothes. Wow. Yeah, yeah she really had the, um, the skill of a, a, a real tailor. I mean, she made her own patterns. I'd seen her, she would use store-bought patterns, but I've actually seen my grandmother make patterns. 
and she had when we were growing up she had a sears kenmore then it was a brand new sewing machine <laughs> sears kenmore and it was turquoise and my mother's sewing machine was probably the machine that i think she got it somewhere i think closer to when she and my dad got married but it's an old singer the old black singer and i I took sewing lessons on Halsey Street in Newark, right on the corner of Halsey and Academy. So the New Jersey Ballet Academy was on that street. So I would take ballet there. I'd go to the Y. I had guitar lessons down Broad Street and then sewing lessons right there on, um, on you know right there on Halsey Street and then of course my mother made this dress but so did all of the other girls in the graduating class because that was part of their home ec and I always wondered I said gee it would be something if they had the boys make their own, oh, <laughs> make their own suit. yeah I mean because in some cultures men are well in African culture all of the tailors when I was in Senegal I would visit the shops all the time and all the tailors were men my grandmother's brother was a tailor, so he, he sewed as well. So the stitching- Your, your was, grandmother, the one, Ruby? Ruby, yes, her older brother. Did he also come yeah. to, like, in this, at the same time? Well, he was already here. He was here and her younger sister were already here. And they were very instrumental in getting her here and getting her settled, you know, in not just finding a place for her, but also, you know, providing the funds that she needed to get these two one-way tickets. Yeah. The, the the earlier when we were chatting, I, I would love it if you would just repeat the story that uh, you told me about your grandmother, Ruby. Um, I asked about, you know, she was a, uh, uh, she had a career, she was a career woman. Oh, yeah, well, when they, when they left Georgia, when she was in Georgia, of course, she was a minister's wife. So that was one kind of life. But when she moved here, of course, uh, she first took jobs working in service. And then she became a Rosie the Riveter during World War II. She took a job at General Motors working on the assembly line, uh, making ball bearings. She would bring the ball bearings home and we, we would play with them. But she stayed there beyond the end of the war. She stayed, she was one of the 30 and out. She did the 30 years and out and she retired, I think in 1975. Wow. Yeah. And your mother similarly had, didn't she have several careers sequentially? Um, not a lot. I mean, she did have, um, oh, I just want <laughs> Just want to go back to yeah. sewing and my mother because right. I think the only thing my mother made was this dress. She was not interested <laughs> in, in all of that sewing, although she did have a sewing machine. And I think maybe I remember her making one thing in my in my lifetime. But my wow, mother that makes it even more special because the one dress she made, you've then you've now created this whole body of work around it. And that's not only work, but it's it's heritage and culture right. as well, you know, which is so interesting. Yeah. So, well, let's see my mother, this dress of course would be the first of her ceremonial dresses attached to her educational career. Because of course she went on from there to Southside High School, which is now Malcolm X Shabazz in Newark. And after graduating there, she went to West Virginia State College but transferred back home to Rutgers so that she could help my grandmother out financially. And she graduated undergrad from Rutgers and then got her master's at Montclair State in student personnel guidance. I think at that time she was the EOF director at Essex County College. And then she took some time off to uh, care for my grandmother until she passed. And then went back to work when all of her friends were retiring. She was about 65. And that's when she took the job at Rutgers and stayed there until she was like three months shy of 90. That's incredible. Yeah. That must be a record at Rutgers. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. And, you know, and the fact that she's a Rutgers alum. And so she's just really Rutgers. <laughs> 
please yeah. be sure and share with her how much we've appreciated learning about her and um and her her life and her you know oh i will and she she loves it every time she thinks i'm talking about this dress i mean if there's anything i want all i have to do is bring up the dress and <laughs> yeah well we should see if there, if anyone has any questions or comments mm -hmm. for adrian Yeah, so uh, it looks like there's not a uh, oh, question. Another RU and MSU family. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, in the chat box, um, I had a few questions for uh -huh. Adrian. Oh, sorry. Let me put my video back on. Um, I was wondering, I feel like um, it's actually incredibly fascinating how much you go into the history of your family and the amount of research that goes into this kind of projects. I'm just curious about um, in your practice as an artist, are there bodies of work that you're, that you, you know, that you engage in and that you do that don't actually have anything to do with a historical lineage that are just about the act of making or, or if everything's really embodied in, in this. Um... No, it's it, the earlier work, the work you've seen the work with the sticks. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, the healing figures. So they're not necessarily about, um, you know, informed by family, but it's informed by spirituality. It's informed by healing traditions that are specific to indigenous culture in the United States to probably anything non-Western, okay. but specifically uh, Central West African in Kisi, a lot of them have bundles yeah. So I, there's always uh, fabric involved, you know, because the sticks are wrapped with fabric, the bundles are wrapped and bound with thread or other pieces of fabric. The idea being that that binding and wrapping serves to concentrate the, um, the healing elements, whatever is enclosed in those bundles that you're concentrating those energies and so I guess to answer your question, it's one of the things that I struggle with because sometimes you want to break away from a particular narrative and just, just do something, just, just create, just for the sake of creating and always, you know, because, I, because I've started with, from this place of spirituality or, um, historical references, you can get stuck sometimes because you're always trying to figure out what the next thing is going to be that will fit within that framework or what will be the next thing that won't fit within that framework. So it's, it's a, that's one of my struggles. You yeah. Know, just create something that is not attached to any of it. And I found some photographs today that I took when I was 23 of musicians, you know, when I would go into the city into different jazz clubs. And actually a couple of them were pretty well known musicians and some dancers at a program at NYU. As I studied, actually studied photography with Roy DeCarava. So mm -hmm. I, I truly do work in um, a multitude of uh, media. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> no, it totally answered the question. It, it, it's, uh, yeah, it is that on one sense that is a different body of work and kind of way of working, but it's also still very connected Yeah. to how you work. Um, so we do have a few uh, questions in the chat box. Um, it looks like there are collars on the white dress. Is this for a specific reason? Or... The dress does have a collar. Okay. Yeah, the dress. On the, um, I think she was talking about on the mural um, in the painted ones. Oh, yeah. But yes, I just... I was, I'm glad she asked that question because I was wondering that myself. Yeah, I decided to leave that open and just outline it to emphasize the fact that the dress does have a collar and it also has a little detail around the sleeve. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there's another question. Um, is there another way you'd like to see dresses presented that you haven't had a chance to do yet? Um, no, what I'd like to do that I haven't had a chance to do yet is create the dresses in metal. Oh. Yeah, I would, I would like to do something sculptural with the dresses. And I think if I get that opportunity, then I can put the dresses to rest. That's, that's yeah, that's my, um, my ultimate dream with the dresses is to create them in metal and have them standing or like a circle of paper dolls or something. <laughs> yeah, or, or even if it's just one dress. One, yeah. And, and sometimes I look at the side of buildings, just huge empty buildings, and I say, gee, <laughs> it'd be great to just fill that, that wall with a, a metal dress. Great idea. You know, the, the original dress is a Swiss dot. So I envision metal with perforations. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's interesting too, to think that that could potentially be the end of the series because then it's also like, it's almost kind of very, very memorialized, very much a monument. You know? Yeah, but you know, the, uh, the other thing too is that you worry, you know, whether or not people are gonna get tired of seeing, you know, it's like, oh God, it's the dress again. <laughs> you know, it's the dress again because it has such a presence on them, and particularly in this area. It's one thing if I'm out of the country with them, but in this area, you know, the dress keeps popping up. You know, but but you know, to play devil's advocate a little bit, think about Willie Cole and all he did with shoes. Well, I didn't want to. I didn't want to mention Willie Cole <laughs> because his treatment of the shoes is completely different than any of these treatments with the dress I mean it doesn't vary much you know there it's always the dress that's right they're shown in a linear way or in the grid as we've shown it I, I yeah but I guess the point is just nobody ever says to Willie enough with the shoes if you if you I do don't know I don't I don't know about that <laughs> <laughs> but it but it works you know it works for him so I don't yeah. know if I laid the dresses out in another way and they read as masks or flowers or something like that. But I, I think- I'm not that, sick of the dresses yet. <laughs> and neither is my mother. <laughs> I mean, I've done other things beyond this. I mean, I have the, the photographs that I took of the actual dress in, again, in the Adirondacks. I've done some video with the dress blowing in the wind and the whole series of, still images and um, video. Well, you know, what's really interesting is the, the idea, I think somebody used the word monument. Um, you know, there's so much uh, attention being focused to the, uh, the examination of what is a monument. And this dress has such a connection to something that we want to memorialize, the, the survival of people who migrate from one place to another and, and very often face great challenges. And it, I, I just wonder if, you know, there's an application for this in, in the context of a monument, because that's really what it is. Well, I, I participated in an artist talk in Newark um, in Military Park about monuments. It was with um, Paul Farber and Salamisha Tillett from Rutgers and, I'm trying to remember the name of the organization. I don't want to get it wrong. Um, in Philadelphia. Oh, the mural uh, arts? The, no, the monument. Oh. What was it? Monument. No, it's not Monument Labs. I can't remember the, the oh. name. But at any rate, this, the conversation was about monuments and who gets memorialized or oh. whose stories are worthy of, you know, being made into monuments or what is a monument? What yeah. in today's time, what constitutes a monument? And who makes these decisions about whose stories are worthy of being preserved? And, you know, the show that Sarah, well, we weren't gonna talk about this, but the show that Sarah curated at Index where I used the, um, the, the glass structures with 
um, documents from the other side of my family, from my paternal history, that is, you know, over 200 years here in Newark. That's one of the things that it talks about in addition to gentrification and, you know, sort of um, erasure and histories and whose histories are obliterated and whose histories are made to, you know, live on and celebrated uh, regardless of uh, atrocities that these people may have committed yeah. or not. Yeah. A, t a timely topic and one we should probably come back to at some point in the future. Yeah. So we'll, yeah. we'll be looking for your metal version. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, me too. Public art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, it looks like um, there, was, there was a few additional comments in the chat box. Um, Many, a few people really love the idea of the metal version of the dresses. So. Oh, thank you. Uh, that, that seems like a win. Um, but then other than that, I think there's no questions. So Mary, unless you had any additional questions, I think. Like, thank you for humoring us with all of our, uh, you know, in inquisition. Uh, no, it's been a pleasure and, and really tired of talking about it. You know, as, as much as I say that sometimes I want to move into another body of work, yeah. I don't, I'm tired of talking about it because it's, it is my history. It's, you know, my mom's story. Well, I know, I know just that we didn't have that much of a chance to share it with people, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, before we had to shut down because of the pandemic, but we're open again. And I have to say that the groups that I brought through uh, in the first couple of weeks, people really, really related to this, all different kinds of people. So I think um, I'm really going to look forward to sharing this with more, more and more people. And I'm glad we kind of have a second chance to do that. So thank you. Thank you. And I just want to look this up because I, looking up Paul Farber, so I do get this. It is Monument Lab. Boomy's in the background, and she said, Monument Lab, and I said, no, I don't think that was it, but yes, <laughs> Barbara from Monument Lab. Yeah. Great. Well, thank well, you thanks all. Everyone for joining, and um, we will, you know, continue to follow us on social media and on our mailing list for all of our upcoming public art or public programs and artist talks and adrian thank you so much for joining us tonight it was just really wonderful to hear all of your stories really expanded on and thanks mary for facilitating that thank, yeah, thank you all it's been my pleasure yeah good night good night, good night.